Today we're going to talk about uncertainty when being physical and wave functions. So this is, this will be uh, completing the rest of 12.1 with the exemption of quantum tunneling, which we will discuss later. So um, I'm just going to write the equation on the board first before we just delve into it. But in your data booklets, you will see this equation. Right here. So the, what we're trying to what we're going to do here is trying to understand what exactly this equation is saying. So we have the change in momentum multiplied. This is of a particle of an electron multiplied by the change of position of a particle. The uncertainties in this must be greater than or equal to Planck's constant, right? Which, um, if anyone knows the exact point, like six point six two six and ten to the power of negative thirty four. I believe correct me if I'm wrong. Over four pi. So this is a constant, right? Which means that these two variables are conjugate pairs. If the uncertainty in the position of an electron decreases, then the uncertainty in the momentum of the electron must increase consequently. Right now, no worries if it's hard to visualize this. We'll go a little bit more in depth. So, let's just say we have an elect. Let's just say we have a light wave right here. Now, visible light, right, is on a spectrum of what, like ten to the power of minus seven meters. An electron, on the other hand, I'm just going to put an electron somewhere there. Right, that is on the spectrum of what, ten to the power of minus eighteen meters. So it's clear here that we can't really, what does it mean to observe an electron? We can't observe an electron using visible light. Right? The wavelength is just too, it's just, it's just too long, too wide. So does anyone know how we might actually try and observe an electron? Or what we could do? Treat it with more electrons. The, the answer would be to actually decrease the wavelength right, of, of light. So if we get a really high energy wave, and shoot it at an electron. Now we're actually able to observe the electron. But the fact is, with a smaller wavelength, we get a larger momentum. And this is actually given by an equation we learned earlier, where momentum is inversely proportional to the wavelength of light. By, ha by having a smaller wavelength over here, our momentum increases. Okay. Raise that. So our momentum increases. And what does this mean for the electron? Well, it means that inadvertently, while we're trying to measure the electron, we actually change its position. Because the result, the resultant wave is a photon, right, in one direction, and the electron scatters in another direction. So in this example, we're able to know the position of the electron in one moment of time, but right afterwards, we're not able to, we're not able to know where it goes or its subsequent momentum. All right, so and I'm just going to delve a little bit more deeper into uh, this equation right here. If you guys are interested in it, there is not its uh, full derivation, but it's a way we can get to it. So we know that E is equal to mc squared, and P is equal to mv. Right, so therefore m is equal to E over c squared. We plug that in, we get E V over C squared, but in this case we know that the, the velocity is also C, right? Because we're looking at the speed of electron, which is basically the speed of light. So we can say P is equal to E over C. And from here, we know that E is equal to H F. Plugging that in, we get P is equal to H F over C. Right? And finally, we know that f over c is just 1 over lambda, which will give us p is equal to h over lambda. So that's just a, a small derivation of the equation I used there to show that in decreasing the wavelength, light will increase its subsequent momentum. OK, so now let's try and uh, delve a little bit deeper into this equation. So if we go back to topic 9, and we go think back to the single slit experiment. Right, we have a small slit here. We have a screen in the back. We shoot the electron through, and we get a pattern. Excuse my drawing, but it looks like this, sort of, right? Is that an electron or a wave? Uh, this would be um, this would be a wave. 
or yeah, okay. So as we shoot, shoot the wave through here, we get um, this diffraction pattern. Well, yeah, this diffraction pattern at the back, where we actually see two minimas. Now let's look a little bit closer into how these minimas are created. So the angle. I'm just going to show you here. I'm going to say this is. Big D. Yeah, we're going to say this is big D. And let's call this small d. Right, so we're really looking to this equation. What does it mean when we have a minima here? What happens? What causes that minima? Destructive interference. Yeah, exactly. Destructive interference. And so that destructive interference, I'm just going to zoom in to so this, so this, so this zoomed in picture over here, happens. When light moves, how much more, right? So there's this extra part that this wave has to move in order for it to just destructively interfere with itself. And that would actually be lambda, right? Because then the wave in the center, right here, is lambda over 2. So these waves destructively interfere, and then all the subsequent waves in between destructively interfere, giving us that minima spot. But if we look at this equation, and we look at the setup, we can actually derive that the equation that, I, I, actually I think this is in a formula book, but you don't really need to know it, but you get the relationship that lambda is equal to d sine theta. And we're going to see why this is important in just a minute. So, okay, so now that we understand this, let's go a little deeper into the double set of experiment. So let's imagine we're shooting an electron through. I'm not going to draw any waves here, but we're shooting an electron through. And so at, at the instant that the electron passes through the slit, we know its position has to be somewhere here, right, in between these two slits. So I'm just going to call this change in position, or the change in x. Right, and let's say that when going to the minima, we have a, ch a momentum p. This electron has momentum p. Therefore, if we're looking, solving the y direction here, we can say that the change in momentum is the length from the central maximum to this minimum. So if you just imagine the wave right here. Why is that the case, sir? So I'm just looking, so this is the change in x, right? Or this is the change in position of the left. So we're only looking at the y-axis over here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now let's say we know that the electron has a certain momentum, mm -hmm. right? And the momentum is headed in this direction, which is the minimum in this scenario. Then we can thereby say that the change in momentum in the y direction will be this change right here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Because so, the electron was coming horizontally yeah, here, right? Yeah, so yeah, changes the momentum of the vector. Exactly. So if we look at this a little bit more carefully, we can say that d, which we just explained earlier, was the change in momentum. Uh, sorry, the change in position. And if we go a little bit deeper into this equation, so okay, wait, wait, okay, wait, wait, wait. So if we go back to our equations from earlier, we know that. change in p, therefore, is equivalent to p sine theta, this being theta, yeah. right? So now let's go back to our earlier equation. Sorry, if this, if this is a bit confusing, we can go back to it uh, in more depth, but it's going back to the equation we derived up there earlier. Right, now if you remember, p is equal to h over lambda, and lambda is equal to h over p. We can say h over p is equal to d sine theta. Then we can say h is equal to d p sine theta. Now, what do we know here? Well, we know d is equal to change in x, right? And we know that p sine theta is just equal to the change in p, 
Yeah. Right, so now this isn't the exact formula that you get in your formula booklet, but it's just trying to show you the relationship of the uncertainty of position against the uncertainty of momentum and how exactly Bang's constant shows up in there. Right? It's a, it's, a, it's a sloppy way of deriving this, but it's just one that shows us across these concepts together and helps to understand it a bit more. Okay, so that being said, let's go on to a small example problem that you guys can do. We're just going to look at uh, a model of an atom, Bohr's model of an atom. Uh, yeah, we'll have, uh, we'll do an atom of hydrogen. So we have one proton inside and we have an electron. So in this scenario, I'm just going to do the values of this. So the electron is moving with V. And this is R1, the radius. I'll give you these values. So R1 is equal to 5.3 times 10 to the power of minus 11 meters. Velocity is equal to 2.2 times 10 to the power of 6 meters per second. And the mass of an electron is equal to 5.11 times minus 35. So knowing this, and let's say we have a 10% uncertainty in the velocity. Can someone, can you tell me what the uncertainty in the position will be? Go ahead, try the problem using this equation from the top. Yeah. Work it out. Yeah, take some time, work it out. This is this is a question taken from a paper, or just do you want them to? No, I, I want them to work because the solution to the question has a few implications that I want to discuss. So the uncertainty in the position of the electron orbiting around the atom. Yeah. Well, okay, if I'm just going to show you guys this little trick. So delta B is 10% or? The change in, so delta B is 10%. So, okay. Um, I'll just go through this really quick. So, our change in uncertainty, right, is going to be our initial value of MV multiplied by 0 0.1. This is going to be our fluctuation in momentum. So yeah. And so if we're trying to find delta x, well, we can rearrange that equation. So we can say delta x is just greater than or equal to h over 4 pi delta p. Right now, I'm, 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 if you put all these values in and plug them in, what you'll get is that the change in position has to be equal to or greater than 2.6 times 10 to the power of minus 10 meters. Does anyone notice anything interesting about this answer? It's big as an atom. Yeah, bigger than the circumference of this atom. Right now, that, that, that's obviously a very large uncertainty. And it also speaks to how the Bohr model isn't the most accurate representation of the atom. And we'll talk more about um, so they're saying that the electron could be outside of the atom. Yeah, which is why, uh, which is why the Bohr model is good for visualizing how an atom interacts with electrons, but ultimately, when looking at calculation, it doesn't really hold up in that sense. So we'll look more at Schrodinger's model as well. But yeah, this is just maybe an example problem that sort of shows you the application of uncertainty when looking at an atom. So, all right, let's move on. So. I'm just going to erase this part really quick. Wait, can you just write what's in the text? Oh, yeah, it works. Wait, Rehan. Yeah. I got the whole derivation thing of how you got theta is equal to delta x delta t, but where does the greater than sign come from? Where does which sign come from? The greater than in the equation. Okay, Why so. Is well, what we're trying to say here is there's a minimum uncertainty. There has to be an uncertainty to this, right? You, it can either be equal to h over 2 or over 4 pi. Or greater than. It could be multiples of lambda. You know, it could be lambda one, two, three, four. Because you have different. Uh, I mean, that is a minimum. Yeah, yeah it's oh. a basically the minimum. Because if you, have, you could have other. Uh, uh, 
Oh yeah. Yeah, which oh, one? Oh, yeah. just the first minute on this. Your That's position? The first yeah. 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 The first minute. yeah. So that, that is uh, trying to show that when you apply uncertainty to the position of an electron, you get results that are bigger than the atom, which doesn't make sense, right? Yeah. So what? So now, yeah, now I'm going to go into a little bit more about the work function and then just show you this model of the atom. So like that's like a gap in Bohr's model, right? Yeah, it is. It's pretty fun. Okay. All right. I'm just going to erase this. I'm going to use this board for the wave function. Okay, I'll come back to um, <laughs> the theory of the atoms in a minute, but for now we're just going to talk about something called the wave function. So uh, we've talked about how an electron, and we've talked about wave particle duality, how it can act as, well as a particle and as a wave. Right, so when physicists realize this, they want, the obvious question is what exactly is propagating yet? Right, what exactly is this wave? So they wanted to describe this, and they wanted a mathematical uh, equation for this, or a mathematical representation of these waves, which is what we express for the simple side. Right? And this is known as the, the wave function. And if we graph this, it can look pretty much like anything. So physicists really try to understand what exactly this graph was trying to say. And I think, I think Schrodinger, he wanted to warp it to make it to demonstrate charge um, density and how the different areas were related to charge density. But it wasn't until Max Borg actually came along and actually um, realized that the wave function is really all about probability, and the probability of finding an electron in a specific location. And so just to explain that a little bit further, he said that if you square the absolute value of the work function, you're able to come up with a probability distribution of the curve. So if you square this, it just looks something like It's a square on the axis. Yeah. So it's square. Yeah. Right, and bank the area. Yeah. Why does it <coughs> square the absolute value? Isn't squaring it automatically it makes it positive? Yeah. It makes it positive. Yeah. So why? Probability has to be positive. It has to be. Why do you have to have two values? Honestly, uh, that's mainly just notation, but that is how it's expressed. Yeah. Okay. Value of wave function. Or the modulus. Okay, so what exactly is this graph telling us? Well, the only thing you need to know about this is that it tells you the probability of finding an electron in that specific region. So this is just distance r. So given this graph, where are you most likely to find the electron? Well, you're most likely to find it at this peak right here. Pretty much based on the area on the, the graph. Now, this is still a topic that is being looked to, into in physics because we still don't know most of the interpretations of the wave function. The only thing it's useful for right now is actually calculating the probability that an electron exists in a specific location. But to this day, it is still being explored. It's still, we're still trying to interpret different variations of it. So, does it continue past the Axes, or is that, is that just it? So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about, um, so that's why in the actual formula, you'll actually see a delta V here. And this just represents the constraints of the volume. Right, so when you get a question, it will be in a specific volume. And yeah, that's pretty much how you can calculate the probability of finding an electron in a specific space. Sorry? Okay. So, okay, let's just continue. Okay, so now we're going to talk about an electron in a box. So this is uh, more of a theoretical thought experiment, but 
We're just going to try and delve into it a little bit deeper. So imagine you have an electron, and we're going to look at its behavior in just a box, with, and it can only exist at specific energy levels, remember, that we have no way, we've known for previous units. So just looking at this box, um, let's imagine this box is a left now. All right. Now if we go back to harmonics, since we know electrons can they do have wave behavior, we're just gonna try and imagine different harmonics of the electron. All right, so in this scenario, we're looking at what would, what would be the wavelength over here of the electron? What would be 2L, right? If we're looking at the next harmonic or the next energy level, what would the wavelength be over here? It would just be L, right? And what we're really trying to go for here is a general description where you can say lambda, so this would be lambda 2, lambda 1, is equal to 2L over all right, just remember this equation right here. So this is we're just expressing the length of the box and relating that to the wavelength of uh, the wave nature of the electron. Now, if we're going over to the energy side, right, we know that the kinetic, we can express kinetic energy as p squared over 2m, right? So we're just expressing different harmonics here. Say. So this would be, for example, be P1 at the first node, and then subsequently this would be P2 of the same representation. So I know this might be a bit confusing as to what I'm trying to get at here, but you're about to see. So when we combine all of these equations, so we have, I'm just going to write a general equation for this, N or 2M. Square. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, so now, well, what exactly, we have the energy of the electron in the box, right? And we also have, well, the kinetic energy of the electron in the box. And we have a, a relationship between the length of the box and the wavelength of the box. So what can we really do here? Well, if we, if we actually take this equation and we merge it with B equals HO lambda, and we solve for pretty much a general form of En. I'm not going to go through all of it because it's a pretty long substitution. It's pretty long substitution, but pretty much you get the general equation of n squared h squared over eight m l squared. Now this is not in your data booklet, so it, is, it would be pretty uh, good to write it down and analyze it, because this, the most important relationship that you're going to try and take away from here is that the energy, the kinetic energy, um, will be proportional to the energy level of an electron inside the ball. Right? If you remember, what, energy, yeah, energy level squared. Now, if you remember, energy levels are, are different ground states that the electron must have, right? So the, the furthest ground state would be thir negative 13.6, and subsequently it'd go up in negative 3.4, and so on. So just keep that in mind. This is a bit, it's a bit, sorry? So what does N represent, sir? N, N represents um, the, the order of the, on the uh, electron level. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, this one would be the ground level, two would be the subsequent level. This is uh, probably one of the hardest things to wrap your head around, but as long as you can just grasp this concept, it will come back to you pretty easily. Okay, so now we're going to talk about Schrodinger's model of the atom, finally. I'm just going to draw it down here. So, in our classical model of the atom, we see a circumference or an energy level of an electron around the atom. So, Right, but if we know that electrons can also exist as waves. How can we visualize this as a wave? Well, what if we visualize it as a standing wave? Right. I'm just gonna draw. Uh, 
Okay. So I just draw an energy and you can imagine a standing wave that just cancels it out, right? That gives it its means properly. So in this diagram, how many wavelengths do we have here? We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We have um, yeah, we basically have seven wavelengths here. So what can we what can we say here? We can say that we have a certain radius. Let's call it R n. We can affirmly say that the circumference of this radius is equivalent to well n lambda in this case. So we're just going to say that. And what's really important here is that it has to be an integer number because otherwise you would have otherwise it would not give you the destructive nature, which would give you the the classical model, the circumference of the classical model. And so with that being said. We can actually go ahead and derive one of the equations that are in our formula booklet just for a key understanding. So, if you remember, lambda is, of course, equal to h over p. So, therefore, we can say that Rn is equal to. N H and H over two pi P. We bring the P over, we say M V R. This is an expression for angular momentum, by the way, is equal to N H over two pi. And then this is just another key equation that you're actually going to have in your book, and this is where it comes from. Yeah, let me just make sure that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So now finally, we're going to go on to one last equation that exists in your book. And this is actually pretty important for actually understanding energy levels as a whole and calculating different energy levels. So the equation is you can draw it first before I derive it. <laughs> Negative 13 point six over n squared. And this is an E V by the way. Okay, so now that we have this equation, uh, this will actually be I'm just gonna erase this part of the board because this will be a pretty light. Yeah. The footprint is not Okay. So does everyone have this copy down, by the way? Because I'm just going to erase it pretty quick. Is this for particles? Sorry. Yeah, this is for an electron in the box. So whenever you see that referred to in the question, just remember the actual equations. Probably sounds like important that we can calculate the equation. Sorry? Probably explain why why that's so important. And we are able to answer. Well, I mean, we're really. Letting, what is it letting us do? Letting us calculate the angular momentum of an electron, right? Like yeah. Under this kind of new wave particle velocity configuration. What, 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 what would it mean otherwise to ask about the angular momentum of the That's what's cool. One side of the equation is referred to the angular momentum of a particle that is orbiting in a circle, and the other side yeah. of the equation is based on the weight that is a certain weight. Letting us get this number, even asking about the number higher number makes sense. Exactly, yeah. I mean, you know, it was, this is the quantization of angular momentum. That's what we're trying to show over here. Okay, so let me move on to the derivation of this equation. So, in order to do this, this is we're going to just come and go across um, three key equations here. So the first one being this is from what we learned earlier is that angular momentum can be expressed as an h over two pi. The second key equation being, and let me know if you have any questions about this, but this is the force, the electrostatic force, is equivalent to r. The third equation being, 
So can you just divine the variables in that? Sure. Q so is the charge of the electron. Q is the charge of the electron. Right, and K is the constant. Coulomb is constant. Oh, okay. And the other one's in trivial forms, right? Yeah, it's in trivial forms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then finally, we're just going to have an energy equation here. That's equal to half mv squared. And because it's a fast electron, it is negative potential energy. So k squared over r. OK. We're joining everything we've learned. Yeah, so now we're joining everything we've learned, right? Everything we've learned in two years. And we're going to try and derive this way. Now, you, keep in mind, you don't have to know the derivation, but it's just pretty cool the way it all starts out. Equation? Sorry? Where's the third equation? Potential. This is just um, total, total energy of the system. Net energy equals potential. Yeah, right. OK. So now, as we delve into this a little deeper, let's see. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to manipulate, manipulate the top expression. And we can do that. Actually, no, we have wait. Let's manipulate this expression first. So we can comfortably say that half mv squared is, in fact, equal to k q squared over 2r. Over right, you got that from the second expression over there. Yeah. So let's just keep this equation in mind. I'm just going to call it one so we can refer back to it. And if we go over here, now we can plug this in. Right, and then get a general, more general form for E. Okay. Plug this in, and this will just be equal to negative KQ squared over 2R. One Where do you get the 2 from the So that's from the equation right above. Right, so we, what I did is the half mv squared is equal to KQ squared over 2R. You can plug that in up here. Subtract it by k two squared oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and you get negative k two squared. Over one. <coughs> yep. So now everything in this expression is a constant except for r. So now we're going to use the other equations to try and find a more general form for r that allows us to express it in terms of n a constant. So how can we go about that? Well, what we can say is. So, if we go back to this expression, we also know that the kinetic energy of an electron can be expressed as uh, momentum squared over 2m. It's just another way of writing half mv squared. And this is equal to kq squared over 2r, right? And if we go this further, say we expand everything, we get m squared of v squared over m, and we can go one step further. Let's multiply the top and bottom by r squared, which will give us m squared, v squared, r squared over 2m, r squared. Right, and if you, if you notice it, this is actually just the squared version for angular momentum. All right, and I don't know if this can actually be seen on the board, but OK. I'm going to continue over here. If you move this further, we know that angular momentum is equal to nh over 2 pi. And if we add it in, we just get a giant expression, nh over 2 pi squared all over 2m r squared is equal to k t squared over 2r. Finally, we'll get a general expression that says that r Exactly equal to, that we solve for r here, n squared h squared over 4 pi squared m k v squared. And if we take this r value and we plug it back into this r right up here, we can finally say that e minus 30.6. Well, okay, we'll see. So it's minus 2 pi. And if you actually want to check this, that would be pretty cool. But these are all constants. Right? All values that we know. All over n squared h squared. And so all of this right here is going to be equal to 
negative 13.6, and then just divide it by magic two, number. Uh, no. Who did this? Who did I do?